Heavenly Father, you have called us out from the busy world and from our busy lives into the stillness and calm of your presence. You have called us to come to the place where you come to us in word and sacrament. And we ask that according to your promise, you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that you would stir up your power and come to us, as you have said, so that you might increase in us faith and hope and love, so that we might walk the way to eternal life, ever trusting in you and confessing your name. We ask these things in your name. Amen. We'll begin with our uh, hymn of our children's hymn for the week in 357 in the Lutheran service book. It's found on page one in your bulletin, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and it's verses one, three through four, and six. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, 
and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God, and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll continue with the intro. Yay. Behold, your King is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. And we'll join together in the glory of Pantry. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Behold, your King is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. For the Kyrie, the... Uh, line music that's written there that's the congregational response to each of the uh, petitions they're not those aren't written in the bulletin but I'll, I'll go through them and then we'll start with that little line we haven't done this liturgy in a little while so i have to refresh our memories we'll start with that singing that line and then respond with it to each petition <laughs>
with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come, that by your protection we may be rescued from the threatening perils of our sins and saved by your mighty deliverance. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Old Testament reading for this first Sunday in Advent is from Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, and that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. You meet him joyful. You meet him joyfully. Ooh, there's a typo here. You meet him joyfully works righteousness. Those who remember you in your ways. Behold, you were angry and we sinned. In our sins we have been a long time, and shall we be saved? We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us, and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord. Psalm 80 is our psalm. This morning will be the basis for our sermon, and we'll read it responsibly. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, serve out your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You make us an object of contention for our neighbors. And our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may escape. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. You took deeper and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade. The mighty cedars of its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea. And its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls? And all who pass along the way pluck its trees. The boar from the forest ravages it. And all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine the stock that your right hand planted. And for the son whom you made strong for yourself. They have burned it with fire. They have cut it down. May they perish and rebuke of your face. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand. The son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. We have a slight and we will call on our name. Restore us, O Lord, God of hosts. Let your face shine as we need to say. Our epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, 
so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please arise for the gospel reading. Alleluia! Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Alleluia! <laughs> and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said. And they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll sing our next hymn in 340 in the Lutheran service book, Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates.
Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. Dearly beloved, waiting for the King who has come and comes again. Grace and peace to you. Contrary to popular belief, the Christmas season did not begin on November 1st, or whenever it was they started putting up the displays in the stores. It didn't even begin on Friday after Thanksgiving, and not even today, on the first Sunday of Advent. My point here is not to be like the old man yelling, get off my lawn, about when people have Christmas decorations and sing Christmas songs. I don't really care about that. Everybody's got their own traditions. But I don't want us to lose sight of Advent, as if it's just muddled together with Christmas, as if it's all the same thing. It's not. It certainly prepares us for Christmas, but there's a distinct difference where Christmas is sweetness through and through, Advent has a pretty big bit of bitterness in it. Where Christmas is all twinkly lights, Advent has some darkness. Advent still wades through sin and doubt toward a future unfulfilled hope. See, Advent is Old Testament through and through. It's bittersweet. Our psalm this morning is a perfect example of that. In fact, the opening words of the collect for the first Sunday in Advent, which we prayed earlier, one of the more famous and beautiful collects of the church here, are lifted straight out of this psalm. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. You hear the longing in that? Stir up your power, come to our help. Don't wait, don't be silent. We are in weakness, we are in darkness. We cannot help ourselves. Come to us in your strength. Come to us and deliver us. This whole psalm is like that. It's a plea. It's filled with questions and with longing and languishing and expecting God's deliverance. See, it's filled with bitter nostalgia. You know nostalgia? That feeling you get when thinking on the good days past, turning back the yellow pages of the golden years long ago. It's sweet because you remember those good times and it can be bitter because they're gone. And the more completely removed you are from those good times, maybe like the Christmases of your childhood, the more bitterness and less sweetness there is. Our psalm has a pretty big dose of that kind of bitter nostalgia. There's a threefold repetition in the psalm, a refrain. It's pretty rare, actually, in the psalms to find this. But in verses 3 and 7 and 19, the psalmist says, Restore us, let your face shine, that we might be saved. Restore us. Turn us back. As if to say, bring back those golden days. Bring back the good times. And the psalmist describes those golden days of Israel's past. Days when the kingdom was not broken, when they did not fight against their brothers, when the nations around did not laugh them to scorn, when Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh walked together in the middle of the procession of God's people before the ark of the Lord on which sat the mercy seat with the cherubim, a sign of God's presence and his covenant with his people. Even the use of those, of those terms reminds them of God's favor. Did you notice? There's five phrases, five words used to refer to Israel here. First, Israel, you shepherd of Israel. Then you who lead Joseph like a flock. Then Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. What do they have in common? Well, Israel's Jacob. Then Joseph and Benjamin, his sons by Rachel. And Ephraim and Manasseh are Joseph's sons. They were Jacob's favored children. And God blessed them too. It's remembering this time of favor, these golden days where God's face seemed to beam on them in favor. He remembers too the glory days of David's empire that stretched from the great river Euphrates to the shining sea, the Mediterranean. Days when all nations paid them homage. Days when all the things that God has promised his people seemed to be clasped in their clapping hands. Days when the temple was built and filled with beautiful song. 
Those are the golden days of Israel's music, too. David and Solomon and the sons of Korah, uh, sorry, the sons of Keturah, and Asaph himself, who is said to be the author of this psalm. He was a contemporary of David. You know, some people don't think Asaph actually wrote this psalm because they think that it's describing the destruction of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians, which happened way later. That's certainly possible. And if it is describing that, either Asaph really did write it, and somebody else just wrote it under his name. You've got to remember that the, the names given to the author of these psalms aren't necessarily inspired. They were added by scribes later who often knew what they were talking about. It's also possible that Asaph did write it and he wrote it in prophecy. It's also possible that he's not talking specifically about the destruction of the northern kingdom. Maybe Asaph just lived a little too long. Maybe he lived long enough to see the end of those golden days. He who had lived during that time of David and Solomon's empire, maybe he lived long enough to see the kingdom broken and to see people flock to worship idols and to see it ripped in pieces like a beautiful garment torn to shreds. Whatever exactly the reason, the psalm is certainly filled with this bitter nostalgia, with this constant cry for restoration, to have what they once had and to be what they once were. He says, how long, O Lord? You have fed your people with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. Literally, it's as if he says, you have given us tears to drink by the quart. I think we can relate. We all know what this is like, don't we? To remember what we once were, or what our country used to be, or what our church once had. Those in our fellowship old enough to remember the time before we left the Wisconsin and Missouri Synod because of their false doctrine may well mourn what was lost. All the fellowship. I mean, just think, in those days of the Synodical Conference, you could basically go to any town in America and find a church that taught and practiced God's word in truth. A country filled with fellowship and unity. Schools for our children, colleges, high schools, and all the rest. What about our personal lives? We might remember days of personal glories past, of faster races run, Days when we look better, or of our best work behind us. Our country, too, these days is mourning a better past. If nothing else, a past when we didn't have to wear masks and worry about COVID. A past when maybe it seems like we could actually talk about the issues facing our country without everybody screaming at everybody else. This is a bitter nostalgia. In all the ways that we, that we find this, when we remember better times past. And it's far more bitter when we realize what's behind it. The psalmist says, why, Lord, have you broken down its wall so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The psalmist realizes that God is the one who has done this to Israel. He described how it was God who brought them out of Egypt. You brought this vine out of Egypt. He says, you planted us here. You gave us those golden days, and you have torn us down. Why, he says, how long, he says, verse 4, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? Literally, it, he says, how long will you smoke at the prayers of your people? It's a metaphor for anger, but it also is a specific word that the psalmist is using to draw our attention to a bitter nostalgia, a remembrance of the day at Sinai when God smoked in black, holy fear as he gave his people the law. See, the psalmist certainly knows the answer to his question. Why have you broken down its wall? Why do you smoke in anger at the prayers of your people? But because of their sins. Because we have turned away from you. Why does God allow difficult times to come on you and me, on our church, on our nation? Because of sin. Sin in general, which has brought the curse into this world, and also sin in particular, your sin and mine. I don't mean that when some bad thing happens in your life, that's God punishing you for some sin that you've committed. I do mean, though, that God is reminding you of sin by those earthly troubles and earthly bitterness. He doesn't want you to get too caught up 
in the golden days of life on this earth. Through sickness and death and sorrow, he would remind you of the bitterness of this world and of our own part in that bitterness. He would remind you of the way that his holiness smokes with anger against every time that you and I have broken his perfect law. I mean, how easily is it that when times are good and days are golden, we forget about our God, turn away from him, forget to thank him, forget to love him above all else because we so easily love this world more. And so, he sometimes sends us bitter days. He sometimes sends us Advent. Bitter days that remind us that this is a bitter world. Bitter days to make us repent of our sins, to long for him, to turn to him, to cry out to him, how long, O oh Lord, restore us. And he does desire to restore us. But not simply to the golden days of years past. No, he wants to restore us in a way far better than that. You know, that word I mentioned appears three times in the psalm, restore us, the Lord God of hosts. And literally, he's saying, turn us back. Turn us back to what you gave us before. But, but there's more to the word than that. It's the same word that's used often for repentance. Turn us back, he says, from our sins. Turn us back from our idols. Turn us away from ourselves and turn us back to you. Only God can do that. You see what he said in verse 18? He says, then we will not turn back from you. Israel's history was one of turning back to God and turning away from God. And often our lives are like that too. But Advent brings this call to repent, to prepare the way of the Lord. And only God does that. That's what the psalmist is recognizing. Lord, you turn to us and you turn us back to yourself. Turn us back to the true golden days, to the true worship of the God who sits enthroned upon the cherubim, the God of the covenant of grace. Yes, the psalmist remembers the joy and unity of Israel's past, and he longs for that. But God, God remembers too. God remembers the golden days before sin ever entered the world. And that is what God desires to restore to his people. You know, by the time that God's answer to this prayer came, most of his people had forgotten. I don't mean that they forgot this psalm. I don't think they even stopped praying. But most of them had forgotten what it really meant. They were looking for a son of David to come and do what David had done. They were looking to just turn it all back. Just give us what we had before. They weren't thinking big enough what God desire to give them, to restore to them, was far better than anything that they longed for. The restoration, that is God's answer to the psalmist's prayer, is seen in our gospel reading. When David's son rides into David's town, not sitting on a horse, not coming with earthly glory, but on a donkey, with humility, and righteousness, and grace, coming in weakness to conquer, because he rides in humility to die. This is the man that our psalm speaks of. Verse 17, let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. The psalmist might have a limited fulfillment of this prayer in mind in reference to whoever the king was during his time. Whatever son of David was reigning on the throne in Jerusalem, he might be praying that God would strengthen him in order to restore the kingdom. But that's not the main sense of this prophecy, of this longing. The one that God's people really and truly need is David's greatest and humblest son. This prayer is for Jesus, the one who comes to Jerusalem to die. He is the man of God's right hand. That, what that means is the Hebrew idiom for strength. I mean, most people are right-handed. And so the right hand is the hand of strength. And throughout the Old Testament, it talks about God's right hand and his holy arm have brought the victory for him. It's a reference to God's salvation. Just as the psalmist said, stir up your power, O Lord, and come. That's Jesus Christ. The man of God's salvation, the son of Adam and second Adam, who comes to turn every bitter pill sweet. He's the one the psalmist prays for three times when he says, 
Let your face shine that we may be saved. Jesus' face would shine on the holy mountain, the Mount of Transfiguration when he shone like the sun. And then that same lovely face would be torn and darkened and bloodied as the sun itself ceased its shining. That same face would fall slack in death and grow pale as the blood ran out. Those bright eyes would dim and close in death. And then, on the third day, they would open again. The man of God's right hand, the man of God's strength, would show God's strength in the greatness of his power. He would come in all his shining glory to rip death to pieces, to destroy its hellish reign. This Jesus, this bright, shining Son of Man and Son of God, he's the very smile of God. He is God's shining face, the one God's people expected, their dear, sweet hope and joy. And he is always yours. Whatever trouble, whatever guilt, whatever sorrow you might face, whatever bitter nostalgia makes you long for days past, whatever makes you cry, how long, O oh Lord, and when, and why, and whatever threat of the law makes you shake at terror, and terror at the smoking anger of God's wrath, Jesus is the light of God's love to you. Jesus is the one who brings good days far better than any that you have left behind. Jesus is hope. This is why God gives us times like Advent. He gives us times that are hard. He gives us bitter bread and tears to drink in order to turn us back to him in repentance, to turn us to long for his light, to turn to him in prayer so that he may give us something far better than any earthly glory days. He gives us the kingdom of his son, Jesus Christ, the kingdom of the king on a donkey, the kingdom of the cross, the kingdom of the forgiveness of your sins. And through the forgiveness of sins, eternal life. This is the answer to all your troubles and all your sins. This is the answer to all your weakness and to all our turning away from him. Then we will not turn back from you, the psalmist prays. Give us life, and we will call upon your name when God sends us Jesus when Jesus comes to you in word and sacrament, in death and resurrection, then he turns you back to himself again and again. He restores you as a shepherd, restores a lost sheep. He leads you, rules over us through the word and in our hearts. Yes, the advent of our king may mean bitter nostalgia over sin and the trouble it brings, but far more, it brings the sweet expectation of Jesus who came as a child to save, who rode on a donkey to die, and who comes yet in power to restore to you the golden days of heaven itself. O oh Lord God of hosts, let your face shine, that we may be saved. Amen. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue with our next hymn, hymn 338 in the Lutheran service book, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. It's on page 9 in your bulletin. Mm -hmm.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the advent of our King, Jesus Christ, our Savior, whom you sent as a child to come and save us, who comes to us now in word and sacrament to rule in our hearts and to prepare us for an eternal kingdom of glory. We ask that you would constantly lift up our hearts through faith to trust in this Jesus Christ alone, to find in him our strength and our hope and our joy in all the bitter days that this world can bring. Help us to turn to him and trust in him in all things. And help us, Lord, also to prepare others for the coming of your Christ by preaching and proclaiming his gospel and also, Lord, by bringing us to show his love in our lives. As all, in all the vocations you have given us, Lord, help us to find these opportunities to love our neighbor and to share your word as workers, as parents, as children, as students, as neighbors, and as citizens, to remember that in all things, more than anything else, we are to be prepared and to be preparing for your coming. Lord, we ask that you would bless the preaching of your gospel throughout the world. Bless our pastors and teachers and lay people here in this country and also in other lands. Bless our missionaries and our pastors in, in India and Myanmar and Africa and Nepal and everywhere else around the world. Bless the proclamation of your word with great success that many hearts might be brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved son, Jesus Christ, who comes for all people. Lord, we ask for your blessing upon our country and community that you would grant wisdom to our leaders and peace and conquer to our citizens. We ask for your blessing upon all those who serve us in various positions, such as doctors and nurses, uh, firefighters, police officers, teachers, and all the rest, that you would give them strength to perform the duties you have given to them and hope and patience and comfort in all these difficult days. We ask for your blessing upon those we've been asked to remember in our midst, for the family of Harold Gilbertson, that you would comfort their hearts. For uh, Desiree Nauman and her family, that you would hold before her the light of eternal life and that comfort which only you can give. For Don Bickham and Kaylee Udy, that you would grant healing in their bodies. And for Missionary Olman, that you would continue to grant him healing, uh, if it is your will. Lord, we also ask for all those among us who may be shut in or simply uh, kept away for a time from services here because of the current pandemic. We ask that you would bless them with the assurance of your comfort through your word. We ask for uh, Carol Gilbertson, Joanne Johannes, Gloria Longwitz, John and Deanna Herzberg, Dan and Chris Ullman, and all those, Lord, who are lost, who are lonely, who are doubting, who are sad, Grant them the comfort of your presence and your coming through your word. We ask all these things in your name, confidence that you will hear us. Amen. We'll continue with the service of the sacrament on page 9 in your bulletin. Please arise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love, shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him in his death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns through all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Creation, 
For you have had mercy on us, and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In your boundless mercy you sent your servant, John the Baptist, to proclaim that in Christ the kingdom of heaven draws near. With thankful hearts we pray, come, Lord Jesus, confident that in his body and blood given us to eat and drink, we receive the forgiveness of sins, and so proclaim his death until he comes again in glory. Hear us as we pray in his name, and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You have your communion packet handy. You don't need to open it yet, but it's ready. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. of all of your sins. Now may this, the true body and true blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true Christian faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Go in peace.
give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll conclude with our last hymn, hymn 337 in the Lutheran service book, The Night Will Soon Be Ended. It's on page 14. Amen. Mm -hmm.
joy be with you here celebrating the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, welcome, Kim, and uh, just forgot your name for a second, Luke, and family. I'm uh, glad to see you guys again. Um, I don't think I have any other specific announcements other than that our um, midweek schedule uh, continues to be service at 6.30, only now instead of being a repeat of the Sunday service, uh, it'll be the uh, midweek Advent service uh, and a different uh, set of texts um, I think the plan will be, though, to because because people are coming generally to one or the other to repeat communion whenever we have communion on Sunday, uh, to offer it also on Wednesday evening. Um, any any other announcements? Well, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with each.